think maybe you can start. Yeah, I'll start. Um, so yeah, uh, good day, guten Tag, bonjour, buenos dias, buena giornata, dobre dien, or ni hao di i kin, and welcome to all public space lovers around the world. My name is Gregor, is Gregor Muse, and together with Hendrik Thieben, uh, I will facilitate this webinar today. So before we get into it, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. I hope everybody has got a nice drink um, and has been able to stretch their leg or have a plan to mitigate the screen fatigue after being so long on Zoom. So uh, this is our third webinar as part of the initiative 2020, a year without public space under COVID-19 pandemic. And with this seminar, almost in a Max Weber tradition, I'd say we, we, we wish to examine the um, salient features of public spaces in city that transcend different cultural regions, enabling us to present and capture descriptions that are literally not tied uh, to time or place, thanks to Zoom. So we've got a range of excellent speakers uh, today with us, and we are thrilled to introduce them, or Hendrik will introduce them in a little bit uh, in detail. And after the qualified inputs, we will have a bit of a round table discussion and Q&A, which is, um, uh, will be moderated by our event managers. And I briefly like to acknowledge Stephanie and Ying Fen uh, from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which we will be looking after that uh, moderation. So please feel free to ask and raise questions within your uh, Q&A function. Uh, all of these questions, even if you not be able necessarily to, uh, to be heard, will be captured and they will help us to inform the future events as part of our series. This, so also at the end of the series, there will be a survey popping up on your screen. So please feel free to participate and uh, be part of the conversation past that. Um, also, at the end, uh, we will wrap up and we will briefly, I will briefly hand over then to uh, the president of, from, of City Space Architecture and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Public Space, Luisa. Thanks, she was, was waving, brilliant. And um, then also, um, you might be interested to know that the previous two webinars, which we had as part of the series, are now online, um, just for everybody who was not part of all of them. The first one was about reframing the role of public space during and after pandemics. And the second one was about innovative approaches and creative practices in public space. Uh, both recordings are online, on, um, both recordings of these sessions are online and this one will be recorded as well. So uh, this event in particular is, you know, if you can think about our urban way of life, uh, which was a definition coined by Louis Bird, is quite heterogeneous. We all know that. And it, it allows us to explore and capture data of diverse experiences and attributes on how people adapt, cope, struggle, or even psychologi psychologically remove themselves in densely populated areas. Louis Mumford rightfully uh, noted in 1938 that the mind takes form in the city and in turn urban forms condition the mind. So let us engage in a discourse that helps us to assess, correct, and prevent those factors in the environment that can potentially harm the health and well-being of the present and future generations. Therefore, I thank you for tuning in today with us and being part of this webinar. And so over to you, Hendrik. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Greg, for the introduction. Um, I will now um, quickly introduce the topic of today's event and also uh, introduce our different speakers. So um, basically our um, third webinar um, will focus on health disparity and public space in high density environment. Um, if you joined the earlier sessions, particularly also the first session, we had already uh, people talking uh, indeed about uh, health disparity and um, mm -hmm. Indeed, if you follow uh, recently the media, of course, uh, in many places, be it uh, in China, in Hong Kong, in uh, America, but basically uh, all over the world, um, what became very clear was that um, the, uh, the virus doesn't affect everyone equally, but uh, there are very big differences um, according to uh, particular vulnerable groups that are much more affected than than others and uh, basically in this session we will uh, focus on this uh, aspect. The other uh, point is because uh, while the first webinar was kind of 
quite general. We try to become a little bit more specific with now this whole series of other events and, and pick out particular aspects. Um, we are particularly looking at examples of cities that are kind of very high density environments and also sometimes go together with very specific um, aspects of health and disparity and also uh, public space issues. And uh, uh, indeed, there is already a discourse going on uh, where people start to, to question, uh, for example, here a uh, headline in Johns Hopkins Bloomberg uh, School of Public Health, is density COVID-19's best friend? So uh, does it mean when we live very close together that this uh, is basically uh, enabling uh, infections? And already in this post also, uh, they are a little bit more careful in, in having such statements, even though they have the, the highlight. Uh, because as we can see, when we look at different places that actually density is something uh, we can look much more um, differentiated to. Uh, for example, if we look at different aspects of density here, for example, from a study uh, website on uh, by MIT a Density Atlas, they have made this very nice uh, graphics where you see different aspects of density. For example, uh, sometimes we have a lot of very high buildings um, and that is a form of, of density in terms of building bulk. Another one is how many dwelling units we have in a particular area. And the other thing is how many people actually live in each dwelling unit. And that uh, can very much affect uh, all kinds of issues, but particularly in uh, under COVID-19. Uh, and in fact, they, uh, when you go to their website, you can see this kind of very interesting comparison where they, for example, say like, okay, uh, New York here, for example, Hong Kong, uh, uh, we have usually a lot of high-rise buildings, although in New York, not every part are high-rise. There are also a lot of more lower scale buildings. Um, and then you have other forms of densities where, for example, the buildings might be relatively small, but the population density might be as high or almost or even higher than in Hong Kong. So I think if we now um, look at different cities, and indeed we, we will look at uh, Hong Kong, New York, and, and uh, India, uh, that is something maybe to, to keep in mind. And I think also some of the speakers might uh, allude to some of those related issues. Um, also, it's interesting, you might have heard about this, that, that um, not all high-density cities have a lot of uh, fatalities, and indeed it is quite surprising that in the case of Hong Kong, uh, which is one of the highest uh, uh, density in the world, uh, so far we have only four deaths, which sounds uh, uh, quite impressive, uh, which might be related to the fact that Hong Kong was related to, to SARS and uh, had a lot of experience. However, uh, as you will see in, in one of the presentation, uh, this number looks fantastic, but on the ground, it might be uh, much more complex because it's not only about fatalities, but also how people indeed our everyday life experience uh, the pandemic. Uh, indeed, um, this is just uh, one picture of Hong Kong, for example, where, where I'm also usually uh, studying, but uh, particularly, of course, when you think about those uh, photos of subdivided uh, flats here, we see a whole family in their apartment, or basically subdivided unit, and you can imagine that physical distancing is not that easy, <laughs> not that easy in a living environment like this. Okay, so I will um, stop here basically just to say that um, this, of course, the space inside is also related to the space outside because particularly if you live in under such a uh, super high density, the space outside becomes even more important because it was usually also a breathing space, but what happens if, if you cannot really use this? Um, so this might be also interesting to discuss. But I want to end here and uh, because we have all our speakers and basically introduce uh, uh, the people that we invited. So we have a very distinguished uh, panel of five speakers basically coming or living currently in New York, in uh, uh, Delhi, in India and in Hong Kong. And uh, I want to quickly 
go through whom we have here. So uh, basically you can see them also in the videos, but uh, for example, we have um, Miodrag Mitrasinovich, who is uh, teaching at uh, the Parsons School of Design and runs there a program for, uh, um, or co-chair an urban program, graduate program. Um, one reason why we invited him, uh, we, we worked together on projects before, was also related to a publication that he uh, uh, published recently on designing infrastructures of inclusion, uh, which I think for the topic uh, today uh, about health disparities and so on is, is uh, also interesting, this kind of question of inclusion, even though this book was not yet focusing on COVID-19. Um, the next speaker will also come from the same university, also in New York in uh, Parsons, is uh, Mindy uh, Fulilov, uh, who is a distinguished professor for urban policy and health. So we try to have different uh, disciplinary views. Um, she's a psychiatrist, uh, but uh, particularly studies the relationship uh, and ties between environment and mental health. And uh, I personally was quite intrigued by her book, uh, Root Shock, uh, that basically um, investigated the impact on uh, neighborhoods that were destroyed by urban renewal, um, looking more at the American context, but I think for those that are in the Hong Kong context, also very interesting read. Um, then we have uh, Mehak Agrawal, who joins us today from India. And uh, She's uh, organizing, she has a background both uh, in the medical field and in urban planning and uh, uh, founded um, the Spatial Perspectives and also uh, will basically today report from the ground zero in, uh, in India and particularly uh, Delhi. Uh, the um, fourth speaker that we have, I'm quite happy to, that we could get uh, Dr. Fan Ning who has also a very interesting background. He's a surgeon and a public health expert, but he doesn't leave it only by that. He also was the president of Medicine Sans Frontieres uh, in Hong Kong for many years. And then recently, in oh, 2011, uh, set up the Health in Action NGO, which is particularly looking at the condition of working poor ethnic minorities and refugees in Hong Kong. And in this context, um, he's also working on people affected by the pandemic. So we are very glad and happy to, to have you here. And the last speaker uh, is Jens Ertz, who is an urban planner and has experience with different international development agencies. Uh, so basically UN Habitat, UNICEF and the World Bank. And we invited to have somebody basically comparing maybe or help us to see a bigger kind of global view on this entire discussion. So this is uh, the introduction from my side. I might come back for the roundtable discussion as a moderator. And I now will pass the word to uh, Miodrak as the first uh, speaker. Miodrak. Thank you, Hendrik. Uh, let me begin to share my screen. Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet. All right. Hold on one sec. It's coming up. Yes. Coming up? Yeah. Maybe you can make it full screen. I, I just did. Can you see it? Yes. All right. Uh, okay. So good morning. Thank you, Hendrik and Greg, for the, uh, uh, for the introductions and for organizing the panel. I will uh, talk today about uh, two uh, examples in New York. In fact, one really and the other one only as a point of reference, uh, both of them along line seven, which is actually a very interesting subway line, the most interesting subway line to, to my mind in New York City. Uh, it connects one of the uh, wealthiest with one of the poorest cities, um, uh, enclaves, so to say. Uh, Hudson Yards so to the west and Flushing uh, Queens uh, all the way to the northeast. Um, so the first circle on your left is going to be 34th Street and Hudson Yards. The, the one on your far right is going to be uh, 103rd Street and Corona Plaza. So the story really of two cities 
uh, that we experience or, or many experience in this city on a daily basis is really uh, encapsulated and exemplified by these two uh, different cases. The world, the global imagination about the public space in New York City uh, has been captured by the High Line, of course, in many uh, in recent years. Uh, and uh, next to it, Hudson Yards, even though those who uh, originally enjoyed the High Line knew very little about what's coming. Once the Hudson Yards was there, the Line 7 was extended from Times Square to Hudson Yards uh, in order to connect the city to this uh, latest development um, that cost the city around $5 billion uh, and, in fact, uh, is the, the wealthiest, by, by all means, the wealthiest, healthiest, whitest neighborhood in the city. Uh, the, if you travel from this place, and by the way, it's just a few more slides to show you how this looks like for those of you who haven't been there. Um, the uh, key piece there is, of course, the vessel designed by Thomas Catherwick, the, uh, the guy on this slide. Uh, uh, the, on March 17th, the place closed, and it can close. It's a you know, privately owned entity, so it can, of course, close anytime it wants even though this was mandated by uh, the city of New York in this particular case. So the place closed uh, and one of his, its key tenants, Neiman Marcus, filed for bankruptcy very recently. Not surprisingly, many more are to follow. And of course, the city, after investing such major uh, resources into this uh, development, is now wondering, as we all are, what is going to happen there and how much is going to cost the city and the state of New York to bail out now this uh, unnecessary uh, predatory development. On the other hand, if you travel on line seven for about 40, 45 minutes from there and go east, you will get to Queens. And first, the last stop is Flushing, Queens, a mostly Chinese, Asian, uh, and Asian American populated uh, neighborhood. Uh, the busiest stop, the second busiest subway stop in the city, in the entire city. And on the way to it, uh, you get to the circle, the red circle over there is 103rd Street, Corona Plaza. These are the images from two weeks ago. So you can see how this place, how the station looks like. You can see the train seven. You can see mostly men uh, uh, in peak hours during the commu morning commute. Uh, and you can see the platform of the, of the, of the 103rd Street stop uh, two weeks ago. This is how Corona Plaza looks like uh, right now. Still, uh, in, in some ways, uh, not a dead public space but the one that has reoriented itself to what's basically a su essential support for essential workers and their families who mostly reside in this area. These are some of the images, people waiting in line for kitchen soup, food banks, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, street vendors selling now fresh fruits because most of the stores are closed and so on and so forth. If you look at all of the data, anything available in relation to public spells, in, uh, uh, public health, environmental, impact, COVID-19, socio-demographic data, all of them basically are combined with the next following slides. This one is an interactive uh, uh, heat index map where you can see the area we're talking about corona is in bright red uh, center left. Uh, right here, right, almost in the middle of this blue map, you can see the darkest spots. Those are corona and Elmhurst. And these are the, the areas where you, even before the pandemic, you know, you knew that uh, the risk factors such as poverty, um, age, uh, income level, uh, health insurance availability, overcrowding, and many other factors were already putting this area at a very high risk. In fact, one of the riskiest areas in terms of public health and all the other issues um, uh, in the city. You can see it here, dark, dark blue. Uh, and you see, of course, that where the coronavirus hit the hardest is exactly there. So corona, uh, so the, the corona, corona neighborhood, sorry, no, coronavirus, corona neighborhood, corona neighborhood in Queens uh, and Elmhurst were the, among the hardest hit areas in the city. To the left, you see Governor Cuomo, who is surprised by it and actually says uh, good research is necessary for us to understand why uh, the poorest neighborhoods always pay the highest price and how is it possible that uh, Latino and African-American uh, residents of New York City always pay the highest price and suffer the most. Of course, and here is the below is he cleaning the subway with the workers. Um, uh, but of course, you know, the research is there. We all know why this is happening. We know the evidence is there. 
So it's not the question of why this is happening. The question is, what do we do about it? And the, what is really amazing is that when you look at all of this recent research, you would understand that then uh, the, uh, 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 the most interesting part and the paradox, the par okay, thank you. The paradox is that you see 67% in the research survey by Hester Street actually say that during the crisis, they were supported by financially and by all other means, by community organizations, neighborhood organizations, and basically the realm of the domain of civil society, right? So no government, no federal, no state, no city, it's just community organizations. When you look at Corona Plaza and how Corona Plaza came into being, you understand that basically the city has invested in, in the creation of Corona Plaza to something called the Public Plaza Program, through which they help neighborhoods in needs create public spaces where there are none or very few. And so Corona Plaza uh, was one such place where Queens Museum is an anchor community institution, helped working with the city, gather the community organizations, and basically uh, uh, create a very vibrant public plaza or at, right next adjacent to the subway stop, in 2018. These are the pictures from last summer, a very vibrant place where a number of different cultures come together on a daily, re regular basis. This is summer 19. Uh, and what is really interesting about this is that this place, in fact, came into being both by people, differentiated communities who speak different languages, different religions, come from different places, come together to create a place. Once the place is created, the place actually becomes a catalyst for an emergence of a new public, uh, which is, uh, I, I find this uh, quite interesting because if you look at what do you need in order to surpass the impasse we are in, you need a resilience at the community level. Where you find the resilience at the community level, seemingly paradoxically, these are the places where coronavirus hit the hardest. And the question is why? Why? It's because proximity, density, interlocking, people living and working together, creating a web of relationships that of course then are exposed to things like coronavirus because it's like, yeah, right. So I just wanna point out this, this, this picture is one of the organizations in the neighborhood. And if you saw the pictures of the slides of pe people in trains, mostly men. If you look at the community organizations and how they're woven together, mostly women. And women are basically the carriers of all of this work in this neighborhood. What I wanted to leave you with uh, are some slides of how this works and how they're organized is the following. On the right is the Corona Plaza, on the left is Hudson Yards. Corona Plaza cost the city $2 million in construction costs and it costs $60,000 a year to maintain. Uh, Five billion is the initial cost for, for Hudson Yards. City money, that's just public money. Uh, and so what I'm, what I'm calling the infrastructures of inclusion is precisely what happened in Corona Plaza. In other words, uh, infrastructures of inclusion, in my view, are the types of infrastructures that communities and civic groups build together in order to catalyze and sustain processes of transformation of themselves, their communities, their societies, towards a more diverse, democratic, just and inclusive city. Uh, they, they do that by both creating public spaces and in return, these public spaces, in fact, transcends the limitations of communal and build a unique public, new public. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miedrak. And uh, I, I was lucky that uh, last year you were taking us everywhere there with our students. And uh, uh, it's very interesting for me to see like how, how the place is now transforming under this crisis. Uh, and I remember that we actually were already talking about um, the need for particularly uh, support for public health in, in that neighborhood. Um, now I would give the word to Mindy Fulilov, um, our second uh, speaker from New York, and who has a very kind of long historical perspective on health disparity and might share that with us. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yeah. It's a great pleasure to be here. The, um, if I were going to show slides, I would show exactly the slides Mia Drag showed. So, because uh, we're also coming from New York, and and that was brilliant. Mia Drag really captured the the Thank whole you. dilemma. What I want to do is come at the dilemma in a in a slightly different way. As Hendrik mentioned, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a social psychiatrist, which means I study social systems, how people are organized. And he mentioned that I wrote a book called Root Shock, 
How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What We Can Do About It. The thesis of that book is that when you destroy neighborhoods, you, uh, or what we studied was programs in the United States of urban renewal which destroyed neighborhoods. And we found that when you did that, you dispersed people, broke up their institutions, um, and threw them into a state of confusion and, and in some cases near despair. This reminded us of what happens in gardening when you're trying to move a plant. And the plant goes into what gardeners call root shock. And so the, the idea that if you're trying to move people and you do it roughly or without enough consideration, it's a high risk event and people can go into a new state. One of the things that, that we then came to define root shock as for people was the loss of all or part of one's emotional ecosystem. If you think about a way of life as the emotional ecosystem, in, in this moment, under the pressures of the pandemic, the whole world is in root shock, I would contend. There is nobody, nobody in the whole world who isn't faced with the possibility of infection because none of us has natural immunity. And all of us have to some extent or another been through disruption. All of our countries have been disrupted, markets have been disrupted, ways of life have been disrupted. Mia Drag's slide of the plaza before and the plaza after, high line before, high line after, the sort of the, the sheltering in place, the managed retreat has upended life as we know it. And this is accompanied in the United States by the collapse of businesses and organizations so that as we go back to life, we won't emerge into what we retreated from. One of my uh, favorite restaurants in, in uh, upper, upper Manhattan called Coogan's couldn't survive the costs while being closed and went out of business after decades of being an anchor of the neighborhood. So many neighborhoods are gonna lose their anchors and as we go back into the public space, they won't be there to organize our daily lives. So not only do we have, do we have root shock, the whole world, but the, the organizations that helped us negotiate won't be there to help us re-enter. So what Mijag talked about, about infrastructuring becomes the crucial psychiatric process, the crucial social process of managing this. There, the United States and certainly in New York expects a mental health crisis of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, grief. This cannot be managed by the mental health system where people have therapy. It has to be managed by community organizations and organizations of all kinds. And so what I wanted to do was give you just three examples that were reported in the news yesterday of how this works. One example, um, and I wrote about all of these on my blog, Main Street, New Jersey, so you can find the links to these. One of them was uh, the organization of New Orleans musicians to videotape a second line performance. So that, as you know, the culture in New Orleans is to go in the street and have a funeral procession that's led by musicians, and this is called the second line. And so they videotaped musicians playing the music so that people who were mourning could have access to it. It's an extraordinary gift to people who are mourning. Um, this, the second is that, the second one I wanted to talk about was a Catholic church in Queens, in Middle Village, that decided since people couldn't come to the church that they would take the church to the people. And so a small procession led by the priest of the Catholic Church goes walking around the neighborhood and people come out with small tables and they create altars so the priest can stop at each house and the parishioners wear masks and the priest wears a mask and the table separates them and the table is the altar and they can have prayers together. So the priest circulates there. And the third is, um, you know, this is, this is, a pandemic in the United States and I think elsewhere in the world that's all about disparities, certainly the topic for today, falling very heavily on the poor across the board. And so one of the organizations in the forefront of addressing that is the Poor People's Campaign. And the Poor People's Campaign 
has called on artists to make posters with a set of slogans, stay inside, stay alive, organize, don't believe the lies. And so they are sending out these, these posters, putting them on their website and sharing them to lift people's spirits. So it, it, this is infrastructuring. And the thing that needs to also happen is the bringing together of the pieces. So to the extent that the Catholic Church and the New Orleans musicians and the Poor People's Campaign can also join together, they will be able to manage the distress of the population. Absent that, the distress of the population will be so great that we can fear terrible kinds of, of civic conflict, hatred, discrimination. For example, discrimination against Asians, doctors, nurses, and people in the street has gone up tremendously because the president of the United States has blamed the virus as a Chinese virus and has triggered prejudice and discrimination. So I would like to just say that Mia Drag's infrastructuring is the key if we're going to have any kind of hope for a peaceful re-entry into life, given the extent and the pain of the root shock that the world is going through. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Mindy, for, for this uh, very uh, mindful um, contribution, uh, very touching. And uh, I would now uh, pass on the word to the next speaker uh, very quickly. Uh, we come later back to, to uh, in the round table to discussion and can, can ask also Mindy and Mildrak uh, more questions. Uh, to Mehak uh, Agrawal. Um, from Delhi, and uh, you can start with your uh, contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, you are muted uh, at the moment. Okay. Hi, thank you very much, Hendrik and Gregor, for having me here. I will start with the presentation. And, uh, so I'll be uh, talking about how this COVID-19 challenge, which is affecting the entire world, but it's affecting uh, the dense population that is marginalized. So India, we know that it's highly dense. We can find dense areas for the affluent, for the middle class, but uh, there are dense areas of 600 persons per hectare and even 1,200 persons per hectare, which exists in slum areas or robustly. And um, this image is showing a typical uh, layout or haphazard layout of a basti. And you can see that there is tiny bits of space in the area. And this particular space, it's, it's not enough to practice the norm of social distancing because each house or each person has a space of eight square meter in which they are living, they are cooking their food, they are bathing, and as well as practicing every other sort of activity that we do. So it's a privilege to even think of practicing social or physical distancing. And this is an example of an image which shows that this blue <coughs> compartment, it's actually a mobile toilet which has been provided by the city government for a slum area in Delhi. And right next to the toilet, you find people who are bathing, who are washing their clothes and also dumping the waste. So this is kind of an only open space, only public space, which the elders as well as the children are using for all sorts of activities. And in this sort of environment, when we talk about planning for healthy living, planning for pandemics or, you know, responding to a situation which has uh, far-reaching effects, uh, more than the pathological effects of the COVID-19, it's really tough. Uh, one of the key uh, issues that these high-density slums is facing right now is the lack of water and sanitation facilities. In the past five years, the central government, under the tutelage of the Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, has launched the uh, Clean India mission which developed over 110 million toilets in the past five years alone. And it shows that in 2014, there were only 38.7% households who had access to toilet facilities, but by 2019, 100% uh, households had access. But on ground, more than 300 million people continue to defecate in the open, even though they have access to facilities. And it's mainly because these facilities are not usable. 
So the threat of that fecal and waterborne transmission of COVID is looming every day. The other issue that even the government could not imagine or fathom when it launched its first uh, lockdown on March 24th was that in India, almost 70% of the people are employed in informal economy. So they are feeding themselves on a daily basis with whatever activities they are doing out on the public spaces, on streets, feeding people or catering to basic service demands. So there are industries that have shut down, uh, every outdoor activity has been prohibited. And right now, almost 60% uh, of the people who were in an informal economy, who were living in, in, in these informal settlements, they have started migrating backwards to their villages. Only if they have a place they can call as home back in village. Because these migrants, they have, travel, uh, they have come to Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, or any other city in India, Around 10 years back, they have, uh, they have sold off their uh, agricultural land. They're living in slum, substandard housing conditions. And uh, many of them who do not have any place to go back to home, they're living in cities. For example, this is one of the highly, this used to be one of the most active industrial areas in Delhi, in the northwest part of Delhi. And you can see that on the uh, right side of the image, it's all warehousing and industrial uh, shops that were built that are, that have been in existence since Delhi was actually for, uh, started developing in 1970s and 1960s, but right now uh, all these uh, uh, industries are shut down, and the workers that are sitting over there they simply say that there's no point in going back because right over here we can either die from the pathological virus or we can die from hunger, and if we go back to our homes we will die on the road because our homes are situated more than 500 kilometers away. The government is not able to transport each and every person from a city to the villages. And this is a kind of situation that the entire country is seeing right now, that people are migrating and traveling on foot in 40 plus, 40 degrees Celsius plus environment at the moment. Uh, so this is the kind of situation and the challenge that India, especially the informal settlements, are facing right now. But there have been several measures by the NGOs as well as the government to provide aid packages. And there is again a challenge of providing that aid package to a specific uh, person because in these uh, slum clusters, there is no direct point of entry in which you can ensure that, okay, if the government wants to supply an aid package, for 1,200 people, it will reach to those 1,200 people. So they will simply drop off at one point and it will be distributed to everybody. But then again, there's issue of corruption and issue of mismanagement of this aid packages. So several NGOs have come up and they're trying to provide some tanks at the, uh, specific locations where people can use the water to maintain hygiene and practice safe sanitation, but it's a big, big challenge that the government is not able to address right now. And it will be a challenge for planners and urbanists as well as to how we plan for a safer and, safer and healthy uh, communities because these are the population which are serving the entire urban India. And that, that's all that I have to add today. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation and uh, uh, again we will come back uh, with questions later. Um, I think it's interesting now uh, that we go to uh, Dr. Fan Ning uh, in Hong Kong uh, that we know of course Hong Kong uh, more as a city of uh, big housing blocks and so on. In the 1960s obviously Hong Kong had a lot of informal settlements. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing your presentation. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, Dr. Fan Ning, you can start sharing your, your presentation. Um, that uh, in Hong Kong at the moment, uh, probably you wouldn't see a big squatter settlements, uh, a little bit, but it's, it's kind of um, a more minor a problem. But informality might actually exist in other forms and is much more hidden. And um, so you will probably some of you might not be uh, aware of all those kind of issues that basically Dr. Fan Ning uh, will explain. So we've seen that actually Hong Kong has only very small number of, of, uh, of fatalities, but it's really the question like, how do the people live uh, in terms of the, the 
mental health stress and so on under this current condition. Okay, uh, Dr. Fanning. Yeah, thank you, Hendrik, for introduction. Um, when I first uh, being received for invitation, uh, I suddenly think about the space. Indeed, uh, it's very much um, uh, special regarding Hong Kong because uh, you can say Hong Kong have a lot of public space because only 30% of the land was used for habitats. But while at the same time, you can say Hong Kong have no private place because it is so congested and uh, the, the so-called the, the unit of living space is uh, so small. And when we think about private public space or the space related to health, I would think about indeed uh, space stand for something to me. It's about social justice, it's about public health. It's about active living, it's about co-design, about the ownership, about whether the citizen can participate in um, making the city really truly their, their living space. And of course, all of this is related to equity. Um, maybe some of you already visit Hong Kong and familiar with the harbor and the so congested high-rising building environment. And to recap, the latest population now is 7.5 million. And when you look carefully into it with microscope, I think one of the signs have been shared by Hedrick is uh, there are quite a lot of people indeed is living in this kind of, um, um, I would say, very innovative way because they are really forced to live in such a way in order to create space for themselves in such a small area. And in Hong Kong, we either call them coffin, coffin space or subdivided unit. And actually, there are uh, more than 116,000 uh, households is living in that kind of condition. And uh, maybe you think Hong Kong is the highest dense area in, uh, in the world, but um, from my recent uh, um, <coughs> look in the internet, I found that indeed Macau, our neighbors, is the highest. But um, what we are wanting to talk today is related to health. And uh, when someone also think about Hong Kong, one thing special is uh, we have the, now being number one in the world to have, a, I don't know whether I, I, I like the term enjoy, longevity, longevity. But about quality of life, I think is another thing. Um, but in order to live long, really uh, money is very important. But in Hong Kong, I think um, the survey I've already pointed out, maybe it's also similar in other countries or, or cities, is um, for the poor households, their household expenditure on average on those essential items related to health, like food, uh, living space, housing, education, healthcare, um, chance to recreation, culture, uh, get in touch with culture and to access to those services is much higher than the average. And the poverty rate in Hong Kong, indeed, although it's a very, um, um, the GDP is quite high, but uh, the poverty rate is really also eye-catching. What does this mean in terms of health? Um, my organization is serving working poor ethnic minorities, and we have some data to show that uh, this population on average, regarding their BMI, hypertension, diabetes, is on average much higher than the general Hong Kong population. And this may be also similar in other cities. But one thing which we think is quite important is a lot of them indeed is not familiar with those uh, public services that can have subsidy with local community resources that they can get in touch with. And this is something which I think is really also quite astonished to me because in this small city, the communication and also those kind of, you can say online platform is so popular. Everyone is using smartphone, but still we have vulnerable group, underprivileged group cannot get those information. Indeed, um, um, internationally uh, in UN, uh, there is uh, um, some treaty or agreement showing that uh, yes, the right of everyone to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical and mental, mental health. And government should commit to do something on that. Maybe you will say all of this is belong to the duty of health workers. But I can tell you it's not. Only the, 
the commitment of our health workers because um, in order to make everyone to be healthy, indeed, we should have the concept that there is a right to health. It's not something um, you can say, um, uh, it's some social caring, uh, that kind of uh, subsidy, it's not like that, but this is the right. And honestly speaking, there are a lot of uh, models already showing that no matter how you invest in the healthcare system, it, can, it cannot make a people truly healthy. There are so many social economic factors, including education, whether you're employed or not, whether you can have a good job or not, whether you are safe in the community, that can make you healthy. And all of these are, are quite important uh, for general public to understand about that. And so to me, I think health equity is something quite important, which includes social uh, inclusion. And whether you are being able to have a healthy status, also including whether you can have access not to healthcare facility only, but also healthy space. Talking about green space, green air, whether you have a community network, whether you have the chance to enjoy those services. And also whether the primary care system also tackling the social determinant of health and not just caring about your hypertension, diabetes only. And so this touched to the point about health in all policy. During COVID, Hong Kong is so quiet. And as the Hedrick have said, we have only have four people die so far with very little confirmed case. But we have quite high of our mask wearing uh, statistics. But is this enough? As quite happy everyone is peaceful at home. Indeed, it's not. Um, every epidemic or every disaster must expose something quite important is uh, those vulnerable groups. And also some people you may think that they are not belong to the public health uh, task force, like the street cleaner, like those security guard, like those people who are doing delivery for any goods during this time of the lockdown. But do they have enough protection? Do they have enough knowledge? Do they have enough resources also to handle their own family? And so in Hong Kong, the underprivileged group indeed is facing the same problem have pointed out by the UN, like information access, there is a problem. They don't have enough resources or timing to source the protective kits. They cannot have access to the life view. A lot of people can have a home office, but how about the lower social class? Home office to them means unemployed. And job safety is a, is a important thing. Education opportunity for those underprivileged children. They cannot have PC at home to go online or even have the fire, Wi-Fi access. Of course, food security and about isolation and the mental health issue. So uh, very quick is uh, indeed health is something very um, related to the general public, related to architect that we, whether we can create a space for people to engage, to enjoy. And I hope uh, Healthy City could one day really come to Hong Kong because uh, Healthy City is, is a united effort by everyone in the, in the city to involve all the stakeholders and have a lot of things is not related to healthcare system, but related to the community. The two things I hope everyone uh, can remember is all of us can contribute. And all of us should also to understand who suffer the most and we try to help them. Thank you, everyone. I believe that health issue is a social issue and we need a social solution to treat and not only drugs, uh, vaccine or injection. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fan Ning, uh, for this presentation. Um, in fact, there are also similarities, I think, to, to the discussions in, in the other cities. Um, and uh, before we come to discuss them, uh, I want to introduce the last speaker, Jens Ertz, um, who I don't know where you stay at the moment in New York, maybe also, um, and uh, who will be invited to, to give some commentaries uh, at, the, at the end of all the presentations. So the uh, word is uh, yours. Hello, thank you for the invitation. Yes, indeed, I'm also based in New York. Um, it's very nice to see Miodrak again, who I met uh, once a year ago, I think also coincidentally in, in a conference that he was convening. So it's nice to see that this 
webinar is also kind of public space where you just bump into people and uh, can exchange thoughts. Um, of course, I've not prepared anything because I I was on, I'm about to reflect on what I've uh, seen. But of course, I I want to rely a bit on a structure of how I see things, and I wanted to maybe explain that um, together with Gregor and also with Mahak, uh, we are within the International Society of City and Regional uh, Planners, ISOCARP. We are developing a group uh, of knowledge around urban health. And actually, we had decided this in March, just two weeks before the, the pandemic became an epidemic. And so, of course, we are thinking together also a lot about how important uh, urban health is, but of course that COVID-19 is also a kind of lens and accelerator of thinking about it and that we are very conscious as urban planners that we should much more gear to back to the basics also of urban planning that we are in a way a kind of technical discipline that has been um, uh, made its, its entry, I think, in let's say shaping societies because of epidemics mostly and that we have to learn from the past but also see now what is our contribution and um, I had written in March a, a, a text on medium uh, just uh, a kind of uh, venting my own ideas or emotions also being contained uh, in a dense city and of course also hearing these discourses about density is bad I think I, I think it's okay to discuss that, but I think what's what's very dangerous to do, also you hear discussions about cities are bad, and I think that's a use, useless discussion. I think we can all agree on that because it's just a fact that people live in cities, and then also our global society and economic system relies on cities on connectivity. Um, but that we can definitely be critical about this. And I had five points, and I want to relate also about what I heard is that. If Mike, for example, says very clearly, like talking about social distancing is a kind of privilege, I think that's true. And I think the confusion also comes from the wording that I think it's a pity that it's not cle uh, clearly stated from the beginning from WHO that it's about physical distancing because it makes it much clearer that that's the issue. And I would also probably um, accelerate thinking or locally that it has to be dealt with differently uh, and that social connections are very important i think also what me had showed to what's happening in in the corona neighborhood or flatbush it's because of the connections the social local connections that actually there is a kind of resilience strategy in place or there is a resilience structure in place and that there's a kind of mechanism to cope with it actually without indeed the governments and eh, that they are not able to go on that local scale. So I think that's important to, as a lesson learned, to also convince maybe the ones that are not working phys in physical terminology to also understand that it's about physical space. Um, I think also there has been very clearly now a need of thinking about the public space as a place where you also develop um, the health system that it's in, that it should include um, the, sp the, the the public space as a spatial vaccine. I think that's also very clear that there's very positive uh, evolutions there that people rediscover the public space as a physical space to be able to re uh, respond to the physical distancing, but also as a space where you can um, somehow have a connection because a lot of people are indeed in cities um, housed in low quality housing and so it's very important to look at um, first of all of course being very critical about the low housing quality but also about how maybe the public space can be an alternative as you said also in the introduction that density is very important to define it and i think it's very important to always emphasize about overcrowding actually and so i think there's good and bad density but it's especially the overcrowding is an issue and that we have to focus mostly on those who are overcrowded in housing units or that have to go into transportation units and eh, that are overcrowded that's that's a very big reflection and something that also in spatial planning will have its terms 
I think also relates with the fact that I think metropolitan planning will become also very important. It's it's maybe a technical, it's more a technical part of urban planning, but you see also with the reverse migration, and uh, that it's very important to start thinking about to also uh, invest in that a lot. Also from a governance mechanism, I think also New York is a very good example for that, but also a lot of other cities that you know that you have to deal with it uh, on a larger scale that goes beyond uh, the city territorial borders. A fourth thing, what I see very clearly is that the neighborhood scale is so important um, that it's actually very important to develop um, or to yeah improve um, resilience systems that are really on the neighborhood level and that that not exist everywhere yet and i think it goes across the globe eh? it's also in uh, for example i follow now closely belgium it's the same eh? it's it's uh, very difficult to see how immediately there's a reflection on the neighborhood level and so important for example schools when they close um, it's really a tragedy it's not only about the educational system it's also about food system so you, you feel like a neighborhood system that can um, respond is very important and it's a hybrid system it's a system that is both it's a kind of whole system uh, that goes over the life cycle it's about how do you um, support children how do you support their education how do you support uh, young families how do you support the elderly so it's a very important um, I think a lesson learned also. And then finally also, it has been mentioned also about mental health. I think it's very important that we, the, those that are involved in two cities design, that we also understand very well that health, that we have a role to play to develop a whole system uh, of health approach and that the non-communicable diseases um, that I think in the health sector, everybody understands that uh, non-communicable diseases cannot be dealt with from a healthcare system approach, and that um, urban planners, spatial planners, play a very important role. And because the space is a determinant of health, and explains air pollution, air, it explains obesity. Uh, also, all these diseases exacerbate um, the impact of COVID as a virus, but also the 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 impact of what what's the response um, and and I agree with we're all in a shock I think maybe the advantage that we're all together in a shock so that we can maybe be much more um, um, that we can be probably much more solid show solid solidarity and understand that this is something we have to cope with as a as a whole society so that's my reflection <laughs> thank you very much uh, Jens um, so maybe we can uh, start the uh, roundtable discussion. Maybe I, I start with uh, one or two questions and then we can open up to also questions that uh, came uh, from the uh, attendee. Um, I find quite interesting um, to go back to this idea that, that was already formulated uh, by Miodrak about those infrastructures of inclusion or infrastructures that can rebuild, uh, that can answer maybe also to this root shock, uh, potentially. Uh, and uh, I would um, ask all of you, some of you have already uh, talked about this, but if you, any one of you could, uh, or every one of you could uh, name like one of the most Kind of promising, interesting um, infrastructure that could help in this particular situation. And maybe uh, I don't want to make a rule out of this, but I could also think about, like, particularly maybe if our health experts also would for a moment think about, like, oh, could there be spatial infrastructures that can actually help uh, the mental stress and so on? And uh, and on the other hand, those that work with spaces, what are those other? soft and community uh, uh, infrastructures, but it doesn't need to be a rule. But uh, um, I would be interested to, to hear that from, from all of you. Maybe uh, you spoke about it, but to, to further tease this out, um, because I think it would be very useful for all of us and also maybe the attendee who wants to start.
with you. Mindy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to I'm glad to uh, start, and uh, I appreciate the question. I just want to say I love Fending's slides on social determinants of health. They they were really just great. Uh, and the point that there, there's so many things that are going on in a society that are determining health, not the healthcare system. And the healthcare system is about 20%, 80% is, is all the rest of it. So uh, the, the issues of how do we organize our housing? How do we organize work? What do we do if we have to have a managed retreat? We, you know, what are the sanitary facilities? What's the clean water? That these are the things that, that make health, that things that we do all together. And so, the issues of how space is organized is, is really all of those things are in that 80% that's determining health is all these things around the space and how we're using it. So the, the space has uh, huge implications for health. But one of the things I think that we learn in, in this period, and especially from the this experience of Ruchak, is that the stability of space is a very important contributor. So People can tolerate fairly terrible conditions it, because they can adapt. We're, we're an adaptable species. That's why we have survived. And it, it's the upheaval. Mahak's photo of the people on the road going home, it, it's just so heartbreaking. It was an extraordinary thing to think of people just leaving Delhi and going to wherever they had to go to. So th that's, that's what... Partly it's the stability we do, um, as Jens was saying, want to have really good, we want to do the best we can. But in the meantime, people can adapt to bad conditions if they're stable. So we have to understand going in the direction of better. But sometimes when we want to do better, we do urban renewal. So we say, let's tear down the slums, let's make something new. And that is just bad. So how do we slowly get to better at a pace human beings can adapt to is the challenge that I, I think we have to answer. Other uh, comments on this? Uh, I think this was quite insightful. Any any other comment on? Uh, I had a comment about the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in India, we have a very robust health infrastructure which is decentralized. So, in urban areas, we will find that there is a facility at city level, then district level, community level, and neighborhood level. And there are too many facilities, to be honest. But when we see that at how the COVID response has been, it's been more at a central level, at a city level. So in each city, there are only few facilities a person can actually go to and seek medical help. So when we talk about infrastructure, it's not just about how we are building infrastructure or maintaining infrastructure, but also how we are deploying that infrastructure so that people can actually access it and not fear from the COVID. Because in countries like India, the poor or even I as a middle class, we all fear that if we go to the hospital for a general checkup, we would contract a COVID and nobody is going to respond to it. We will be simply thrown into a facility where the chances of uh, the uh, infection getting worse is much higher than staying at home and not doing anything about it. So it's all about how people, how the administration, how the health professionals are interacting with each other and utilizing the infrastructure which is already there. Other, other comments on the infrastructures? Um, yeah, um, I, I want to also re-echo with uh, uh, what James have said about um, we, should, we should call it a physical distancing but not social distancing. And also about the space is not just a physical infrastructure, but also about social relation, mutual social support, and that kind of the link neighborhood that can help each other to to combat all all this uh, pandemic. The 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 reason, take the example of um, the Hong Kong community is, uh, as I have said, uh, there are a lot of information. We are overwhelmed with different information. We are overwhelmed with um, all the um, uh, protective kits, bars, sanitizer, you can get it here, there, where to find the, the, um, um, the, the, the good things that can help you to protect yourself against the, the virus. But 
with this kind of the information because i also see some of the question online is about um, in this era with such kind of so informative um, um, <clears throat> things um, i i would rather um, take the other point is uh, how to trust the information indeed finally we go back to basic is uh, we find our social network for the one who we can believe maybe it's your family doctor maybe it's your mother maybe it's your wife maybe it's something you trust in your neighborhood and for the ethnic minorities in hong kong and also for those um, um no matter it's a knowledgeable people or underprivileged people they they talk a lot online uh, gossip everything uh, with a uh, social distancing uh, or not okay physical distancing with a barrier over a mask but finally um how to they get the confidence or how to they get um feeling a bit of um less chaotic among um this difficult period they need a kind of really social support okay then we go back to whether it's a zoom it's a whatsapp it's a direct phone call or any other things but for those elderly they really need a face-to-face -face interaction for some of the people they really need to see familiar faces in order to make them can overcome this difficult period and this is not something the technology can can help and i also believe we, i also read some story from from other country is is the same so to create a space is not just uh, as uh, some of you have said to pull down the slum or just uh, to to rebuild something very fancy how we can rebuild the social connection or to keep the social connection i would say no matter it's a peaceful period to develop further develop a city or in this kind of covid uh, uh, pandemic i think this is something um, maybe authority or maybe healthcare system cannot cannot handle i have no answer but just a reflection thank you very much uh, dr funding um uh, Mildred, you you wanted to I'm oh, sorry, sorry I, I got disconnected. It's weak Wi-Fi, so I, okay. I apologize. I was out for a few minutes. I'm not sure if we were still responding to your first question. I just wanted to respond to something that uh, Dr. Ning was just mentioning. Uh, and for the record, so infrastructure is not a term. I borrowed it. It's a term from other people who have done uh, work on, on, on infrastructure. And infrastructures of inclusion, however, uh, is uh, my term, I mean, it's, I haven't invented the wheel, but I want to say it is inspired by the work also of many people and among others, uh, Abdul Malik Simon's work. His point is when everything is no government, there, is no, there, is no, there are no resources. At the bottom line is, unless you have a, a trust and uh, um, sustained uh, uh, relationship, relations and relationships at the community level, uh, you cannot sustain your group, your community, your neighborhood, and so on and so forth. So therefore, the idea of this um, infrastructure is the trust, rebuild trust for trust lost, trust and new. Without the trust, it was saying the technology facilitates the uh, uh, trust. can primarily form for contact in and other applications. Plan should take into account uh, uh, everything needed for a community or a neighborhood to be used. And it doesn't have relationships, community uh, networks, and the, and the buildup of trust, uh, then I don't know what does. 
so I think it's very important to understand that also it's not just about space. It Mio Drak, I think we we lost you. Um, I think we we got probably the point of the trust, uh, but I would say maybe because the connection is relatively difficult uh, from your side. Uh, I have maybe one more kind of small uh, question to to the panel, and then I would ask Infen to afterwards to to come with a question from the uh, audience. Um, uh, one thing that uh, could be also interesting to discuss, uh, particularly, um, I don't know if, if Anink or, or, or any one of the others uh, want to respond to this, uh, that's also the question of access to public space. Uh, like for, ex for example, uh, particularly to in, in people living such in such cramped conditions, for example. Um, one story that I heard uh, from Hong Kong, for example, that um, in, in one case, for example, a family, uh, lives in a subdivided flat and just next door are big parks actually, but they cannot access those big parks because, for example, they couldn't access uh, masks. And in the, particularly in the Asian uh, society, I think for good reason, I believe, uh, it is of course um, an important part to, to wear masks. Um, so there might be some kind of hurdles that you, you wouldn't even think about because on the on the first view you would think oh there it's actually a public space why not somebody who lives so crammed and so on can use it but there are all kind of obstacles why people might have difficulties to to reach those spaces even when they exist so that that would be something uh, i would find uh, interesting to to raise uh, to 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 some of you because we come of course more from the design part and we think we we make a good job, but then actually, uh, maybe in those crises, uh, they don't really help because something else is in between that actually make it difficult to, to even use those places. Are there, so for example, the, the, the question of access to, to public space when it's needed, uh, are there any obstacles? Anyone want to say something about this? Uh, I think Jens, you want to say also something and then maybe also from me afterwards. Yes, no, I, I, that's very interesting what you say. Um, I can say that in Belgium, for example, the epidemiologists who have been really gearing the, the response on the crisis, for example, they, they were very aware of that there's a lack of masks uh, in Belgium at this moment. I think it's the case in a lot of countries that uh, knew this, that it was coming, and that they have not said it explicitly, but actually it, it shows that in the beginning they there was a reason why they didn't want to impose masks because they knew there's a lack and you know when there's a lack of masks of issues that it's always going to be the poorest or the, mo the people who don't have uh, the resources to buy them and then they knew that they couldn't impose that and of course there's now a lot of backlash like a lot of criticism of people we told you so you should have been imposing masks but actually knowing that there was not enough masks i think it was a very um, yeah, social measure to not uh, to not impose that because uh, it would have also had uh, uh, other effects on these people. Anning, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, you are muted at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah um, I think in Hong Kong, why the people are so crazy to get a mask initially is, uh, of course. Uh, we listen to the public health expert uh, in government or in university to get a mask in order to protect ourselves and in order to come out to the public space. Uh, because at one time for those underprivileged uh, families, uh, when they don't have the masks, they keep the mask to use for maybe some of them, I, I, I encounter use for more than one week because they can't have replace, they can't have uh, resources or have, have chance to replace their mask. But also I heard my friend in UK saying that uh, if you wear a mask to come to the public space, you are, you are under threat. So it is really depends on where, where you live. Mm -hmm. And this is your, your social network and also uh, how the, the neighborhood system work around. Mm -hmm. And now in Hong Kong, when, when the mass uh, supply is more stable, everyone 
become more happy. And even the government said, uh, uh, of course, we are still, although we loosen about uh, the physical distancing, but it's still uh, in place. But people are getting out to the public space to get the food, to, to get to see people, to see their family, to see the elderly in, in the elderly homes. We already uh, we start um, this kind of the, um, the social activities. This was also, I think, one of the, the secrets probably of the success in, in Taipei and so on, uh, where basically um, from the beginning, there was a very smart strategy to provide everyone with, with masks and it took a lot of pressure out in the population. Uh, seeing this, uh, I want to pass on uh, to, to Ying Fen. Uh, who's at the moment in Taipei also. Uh, but uh, um, can you uh, choose one of the, the questions from our audience? Or I don't know if you want to share on the, the mass part. Uh, and otherwise, you can maybe pass on to our audience. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, it seems like uh, um, some of our attendees, they think maybe uh, density is an issue, uh, especially under this kind of influence of the COVID-19. But some of them think maybe density of the city is not the real issue um, in this uh, in this uh, situation, but it seems like every uh, lots of them, no matter which side they are standing for, they all wondering about as a planner or as a, a practitioner, how could we do in the future? Maybe how could we to help a, a community that already got a shock by the COVID nineteen? Can they? Uh, still working as uh, their original function as how the uh, uh, help people to communicate or get the access to um, this kind of health health help they needed, or how could we do to um, to use the planning as a, a a a way to resolve this issue, especially under uh, this kind of situation of the of the neoliberal system. I think that's a very interesting question from the attendee I, I, I found, yeah. Okay, anyone want to answer on this? It's a very wide question. <laughs> Mir uh, you can try, I hope just connect. very briefly. Uh, sorry again, I got disconnected again, uh, so uh, just very brief why I had the images of uh, Governor Cuomo uh, and started with uh, the Bloomberg Cuomo deal, which was the Hudson Yards. Uh, and that's why I mentioned the, the um, is, is because you are absolutely right that much of what we are talking about from a particular perspective can be seen as ameliorating the effects of the neoliberal system or the capitalist system that in fact, uh, as, as a, simply a mode of operation, creates inequality. Uh, it's not a, it's not a, it's just a, some sort of, you know, a side effect. It's actually the effect of the capitalist development, intense capitalist development is to create inequality. So it creates places where poor people live and it creates places where rich people live, the city of the rich and the city of the poor. So if you look from a strictly Marxist perspective, you would definitely say that everything we talked about is simply ameliorating the effects of neoliberalism. However, if you look from a slightly different perspective or a number of different perspectives, you can also see that there is no such a thing as a process of urbanization in which uh, communities have not, successful process of urbanization in which communities have not played, uh, and communal work has not played a, a key fundamental role. The government cannot do anything, but of course this work has also to put, to create conditions in which government will be accountable. So that's why, for example, I take two, two projects of the same government uh, to exemplify where it did something totally wrong and absolutely unnecessary, which is Hudson Yards, and wasted public money for decades to come, and where it did something right with the public plaza program, where it enabled the communities actually to come together through a, through a catalyzing organization, communal organization and create the public space with the funds and the know-how and the construction resources from the, from the government, city government. So, you know, the same government did both things. Uh, and this is, the, this is the paradoxical world in which we live. 
Thank you, Mio Drak. Any anyone of the others that still want to answer to Ingvan's question? Let me see. Uh, I just had one idea to share. Mm -hmm. uh, so when there's a lot of discussion going on on how urban planning or urban design will change with the pandemic, and we can see that in different parts of the world there is a requirement for any plan to, uh, to be notified by the government that they have to do an environmental impact assessment or a hazard impact assessment in which we have to look into various forms of hazards with be it man-made or natural so why aren't we looking into health risk and health-based assessment and look into various kind of health risk whether it's waterborne airborne or any other health risk, because there's not one solution that will fit all. There would be variations within a city, within a local level as well. So we need to have that different layers of risk and what infrastructure or what capacities are already there on ground, which are the capacities which everyone together has to build, and which are the shortcomings that we can easily overcome in the short term, medium term, or the long term. That is what I think should be one of the priorities once the COVID uh, starts to become a part of our lives, because it will have to become a part of our lives. In, indeed, some, uh, some uh, uh, countries, for example, in Europe, have started to, to think about basically having health factors for uh, assessment. However, they were caught by surprise, I think, by the pandemic. Uh, so, uh, so I think uh, it wasn't kind of necessarily filtered in, right, in, in the discussion, right? Um, Benny, uh, Benny, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think Mahak's point is, is really, there are two things I, I just wanted to emphasize. The first is that actually we have known that such a pandemic would come for a long time. People have talked about an aerosolized virus that could sweep through populations. So this is not news and we didn't prepare. Uh, but also it, it tends to happen, don't you find, that we prepare for the thing that just happened and we don't prepare for the other thing. So Mahak's point that we have to be thinking about waterborne diseases, about airborne diseases, about, um, and also we have to be thinking about the fact that the abuse of the environment has created easy ways for viruses to jump from other species to humans. And we are gonna have emerging diseases probably at an increasingly rapid pace and we won't know how to manage them at first because they'll be brand new. So the uh, one part of what we ought to be doing with the environment is not abusing it. Jens, uh, maybe last, last comment, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or, or I think Jens and, and funding, I think there seem to be yes. a lot of reactions uh, uh, on this uh, important point, yes. Yeah, I think it's interesting what Mindy said. Um, and also maybe just to be uh, more provoking, I like everybody refers to uh, Gates that has been saying that uh, five years ago already there's gonna be a pandemic. But I find it also uh, an opportunity now maybe to also gear to this foundations that have been saying this to say it's not only about now finding a vaccine i think it's also about indeed including uh, sustainable urban planning let's say at large into defining a health system a global health system that can deal with this because it's uh, it's very related and so i find it a bit odd that um, that uh, this very famous person, I'm not targeting him because he's a very good philanthropist, etc. I guess, but that it, his, his action is completely focused on finding vaccines, yeah? so a very med medical approach, whereas I think we all are discussing now that it's also very important to, uh, to find uh, the good balance between nature and urbanization, crowding, also community support that is able to deal with it. And I, I find we have to create that opportunity now to discuss that, that it's part of a, of a lesson learned uh, for the future. Funding, I think that's also an important point for you, enough. And maybe funding and th then afterwards I give to Greg and Luisa, yeah. <laughs> um, I agree that uh, now it seems that we are forced to choose to believe like this. I would, what I mean is uh, 
could we have a choice to design for an uh, environment that we would like to live in? Um, I would say uh, why this virus would erupt suddenly is not erupting suddenly. When you think about how we use the antibiotic, when, we, when you see how we try to suppress everything we feel very afraid of, uh, it will infect us, it will affect us. We are creating a super bacteria and super virus every day. And we try to create an environment that we live in. in we look, it looks like very clean, concrete environment that is easy to clean with, easy to disinfect. And then we go on to earn money. And then we go on to get the energy source to keep our present living. And then every day we say we want to live environmentally. We want to get fresh food. We want to get something really organic. But while at the same time, we are trying to disinfecting the earth. I think everything is very schizophrenic. We are afraid of infection and we try to kill all the germs, but the germs is part of the earth and it's part of the ecosystem. And then the doctor then come up and the health system try to come up to heal everyone with those kind of the disease. Maybe you can say uh, I'm a bit crazy, but I would say um, it's, a, it's a choice of life. And our choice of how to live with our life to create a kind of environment, we would see the consequence. And this is something um, which I see from not only a surgeon, a public health people, but also as a father, as an ordinary people sitting back and look back on everything. It's yeah. uh, fun. That, that, that was yeah. and very good. Uh, I can just echo that. And, you know, certainly concepts like biophilia and really embracing the power of community and focusing that to uh, reinvent our uh, the way of how we want to live is really um, the way to go. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to hand over to Luisa Bravo um, uh, to have the few remarks towards the end and um, give, uh, send us off to the uh, next events coming. Uh, Luisa, over to you. Yes, thank you very much and thank you to the speakers uh, for this uh, very interesting talk today, which is, uh, you know, trying to create a bridge between uh, what we do as uh, architects, urban designers and urban planners and society at large, uh, tackling issues related to public health, which is very important. And also this is part of a conversation that most of us um, have already been involved, I believe, which is breaking the silos and try to be uh, as, as, um, as much as we can into transdisciplinary approach when we deal about uh, sustainable urbanization. And, uh, and today we talked about the uh, high density environments. Uh, and so it's not just about, you know, designing uh, those environments, but it is about also taking care about the uh, conditions of uh, communities living in those environments. And I really much appreciate the intervention from Mio Drag talking about uh, trust. Because this is, uh, I mean, now we understand why trust is very important in regard of, uh, you know, community support and solidarity, but especially in regard of uh, political support that uh, we are all now, you know, asking to local government, regional government and national government. Um, so, I mean, this is, uh, this is difficult. Uh, I'm, I'm from Italy, I'm in Italy, and this is becoming extremely difficult right now. I mean, to find that kind of trust and to find support and to understand how to, to go on, how to continue our life to what they call the new normal, but actually it is a big crisis at the economic level that is having a huge impact on human living conditions. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for all the speakers. I just want to give you some uh, small information and announcement regarding what's, um, what, what will happen next. 
um, just to close these um, amazing uh, three webinars that we had in May, what we would like to do with the fourth webinar is uh, to follow up uh, to major uh, contents and discussions uh, um, that we developed uh, throughout the three previous webinars. Um, so we will have some speakers uh, for the fourth webinar uh, discussing the outcomes of the three previous uh, webinars and then we will uh, include uh, um, the, a lot of questions uh, from the audience because now we're working on a summary of what we discussed and we are reviewing also all the questions that we uh, have collected from previous webinars. And so then we will try to open um, to uh, a large discussion with the audience uh, as much as we can, uh, collecting uh, previous questions and uh, uh, real-time questions during the fourth webinar. So because the idea that we had when we started this uh, initiative was to engage global experts but also engage the audience uh, um, and so to, to have a kind of uh, feedback and to have like a global discussion uh, between experts, uh, non-experts, uh, and having that kind of transdis transdisciplinary approach, as I mentioned before. Um, and then in June, uh, we are opening the second series of the initiative. Um, we will uh, publish updates on, on the website, on the webpage of the Journal of Public Space. And if you didn't already subscribe to our mailing list, please do do that so that we can send you uh, updates and invitations to future webinars. We are also working on additional contents uh, as reading materials for each webinar as that uh, we go together with the, the videos that we are recording for each webinar. So it's not just uh, Webinars, it's all about collecting knowledge and experience from all speakers, questions from the audience, so that we can foster global discussion and hopefully to inform uh, uh, policies uh, for um, top down approaches and uh, to uh, inspire communities to respond to this uh, pandemic. Uh, so Thank you again very much to the host, Hendrik and Greg, and to the speakers, uh, Mindy, um, Mia Drag, Mahak, Fan, and uh, Jens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.